void with you, Artorius. May the Dread Father grant you the welcome you so richly deserve. So, we're going to fight birds. If only my Reman Dragoons could see me now, channeling the arcane to defeat poultry. You know, it's times like these that I really wish I had a sense of humor. But since I don't, I expect you to keep the details of this entire escapade to yourself. You're really reaching. Enough small talk. Let's kick the droppings off our boots and get on with it. Victory! We pick the bones clean and plunder them. It took me the better part of a decade to perfect it. Every stone and flower tells a story. Tales of how things were. How they ought to be. I thought about destroying it on more than one occasion. I'm glad I didn't. I know. Ask and I will answer truthfully. Just know that the truth often fails to satisfy. You expect something grand, but I promised you the truth. I am only what time and circumstance made me. Son of a lost house, friend to a fallen king. Some will tell you that we are the product of our choices. I've never found that to be the case. I am whatever the people need me to be. A guardian, an oppressor. For some, too distant. For others, too meddlesome. I am the canvas upon which they paint their dreams and resentments. A vessel for their hopes and doubts. A mirror. Nothing more. I don't. But my companions, Vivek and Almalexia, see their divinity as essential. Godhood brings them joy and purpose. They find meaning in the theatrical. Who am I to deprive them of that? Almalexia defies simple analysis. I doubt she could even describe herself accurately. To understand Almalexia, you must first understand the value of fiction. Vivek fancies himself the poet, but in truth, Aeon is the greater storyteller. Vivek knows the boundaries that separate fact from fiction. He knows them so well that he's learned how to break them. He exists inside his verse, but recognizes the lies, the contradictions. He both does and does not believe his own tales. She believes her tales implicitly, as does everyone else. Her capacity for deception appears limitless. She sows lies like a master gardener sows seeds, and the harvest of trust and adulation is breathtaking scope. Not in the slightest. As I said, we are, all of us, bound by our nature. Armalexia does what she does because she cannot do otherwise. It will not end well. But then, even the best endings rarely bring joy. Vivek is my brother. He knows my struggles and I know his. That knowledge makes our relationship complicated. To truly know someone is as much a curse as it is a blessing. 
Regret. We are bound by that, at least. He also suffers a kind of enslavement. Not unlike my own, in fact. Beauty holds the keys to his shackles. Beauty and the love of great works. Great heights. His appetites are insatiable. Thus, his despair. Yes, a poet's despair. Vivek craves radical freedom. The death of all limits and restrictions. He wishes to be all things at all times. Every race, every gender, every hero, both divine and finite. But in the end, he can only be Vivek. Not even remotely. I sometimes ask myself the same thing. May I confess something to you? I suffer from a peculiar ailment. Shall I describe it? I bear the cruel weight of certainty. Total, absolute, relentless certainty. People rarely comprehend the luxury of doubt, the freedom that comes with indecision. I envy you. Indeed. But such questions are flaccid. Cursory indulgences that come and go in an instant. The truth is that my actions, both good and evil, are inevitable. Locked in time. Determined by chains of action and consequence. Compelled. This city serves a noble goal. The redemption of Tamri. The unification of competing forces. The destruction of the Daedra. Unfortunately, it is an endeavor built upon a lattice of corpses. Betrayal, untold horrors. Do you understand? Maybe. The word I covet above all others. Hold to that word, my friend, and never let go. I instructed Devaith to run from the battle that is to come. Now, I urge you to run toward it. Long ago, I broke a truce with the princes of Oblivion. This pact bound eight princes to an oath that they would never again set foot on Tamriel. Nocturnal was not present when the princes signed the Cold Harbor Compact. Thus, she flouts its restrictions. Now. This is important. Nocturnal does not act alone. Two other princes lie in wait. Plavik is vile and Mafala. Schemers. A prince of foul bargains and a prince of lust and conspiracy. They pose a significant threat to mortals when they act alone. When they act in concert, especially with Nocturnal present, the threat becomes existential. I have preparations to make outside my clockwork realm. You must stay vigilant. Take heed of any Daedric incursions and stand ready to fight. The prisoner wields great power, making reality a metaphor. We will need you before the end. A fool's hope, perhaps. I should explain. Look around you. All of this exists because it must exist. I stand here, in this place, in this moment, not because I wish to, but because I have to. A result of action and consequence. Clever, but incorrect. The prisoner must apprehend two critical insights. First, they must face the reality of their imprisonment. They must see the determinative wall. The chains of causality that bind them to their course. I have, but I fall short of the second insight. The prisoner must see the door to their cell. They must gaze through the bars and perceive that which exists beyond causality, beyond time. Only then can they escape. I see only unsteady walls. If the people of Tamriel must exist inside this cell, 
I will make sure that the walls are stable, the gaps are sealed, and all who remain stay safe within it. Good. I pray you never do. I've met few heroes like you. Very few. I take this matter, the Triad, upon myself. But in truth, you may be the one that saves us. The prisoner who frees the world. We shall see. Farewell.